Hi, my name is Roger Hallam and I'm going to talk to you about the Final Death Project and why disrupt the public. I'm starting with this. At two degrees centigrade of global warming, there will be 1,000 million refugees. At two degrees global warming, there will be a billion refugees. Okay, I want to say a few things about this before I start. So first of all, this comes from a peer-reviewed paper, Gold Standard Science. The paper is called The Future of the Human Niche. You can read it. I've spoken to two of the authors about it, and this is their prediction. So something else you can say about this is that it's an estimate. In other words, it could be wrong. In other words, it could be a lot worse. It could be 1,500 refugees. It could be only 500 million. So it's a bit like me saying to you, I'm going to put your children on a plane and there's a 5% chance they're going to die. And you say to me, well, that's not so bad because it's only an estimate. And I say, well, there could be a 10% chance or there could be a 2% chance. But you're not going to say that to me, are you? You're going to say, I don't care what the estimate is. No way am I putting my children on your plane. The real question in this video is, if you were going to put a thousand million of the poorest people in the planet on the plane, and there was only a 30% chance they were going to die, what would you do? Would you say, well, it's an estimate, so I don't really care? No, of course not. I'm going to say, that's a death project. And that's what this video is about. Okay, so what you probably want to know is, when is this going to happen? When are we going to reach two degrees? When is it going to be a thousand million refugees? So a good estimate is 2035, maybe 2040, maybe 2045. That's the estimate of conventional science. But conventional science has been structurally conservative, as it were, for a good 30 years now. What that means is, is they tend to underestimate when things are going to happen. So, for instance, they said the Arctic will be melted in 2100. Peer-reviewed papers now estimate 2035. They estimated we'd cross 1.5 degrees, maybe 2050. Now it looks like it will be at least before 2030. Um, so we've got to be smart about this. It's very possible that this will happen within 15 years. It's not impossible it'll happen within 10 years. Again, these are estimates. So if you want to go for 2040, that's fine. But if you're going to be smart, you're going to say, well, there's a high likelihood it will be happening in the next 10 to 15 years. That's what an estimate is. OK, the second thing you're probably asking is, OK, what does 1,000 million refugees actually look like, right? It's not just 1,000 million people, you know, quietly queuing to get out of their country. Lots of other things happen at the same time. So if you look at the sociology of social collapse, you can make a few estimates. So for instance, in Syria, there were 5 million internal refugees and half a million people were slaughtered. So you could say that 100 million of these people will be dead by 2035, 2040. In the Congo, which is the biggest example of social collapse since World War II, around 5 million people were slaughtered and around 2 million women were raped. So maybe 40 million rapes, 50 million rapes will be happening. And that's before you've factored in all sorts of other 
consequences of social collapse, war, collapse of the economy, economic recession, depression, mental health crises, states running out of money. So that's what's coming down the line, according to the experts. Okay, so the next question you're going to be asking is, can we stop it? How likely is it that we're going to be able to stop it? So to answer that question, I'm going to talk to you about 1.5. So 1.5 is now locked in. Why do, why do we know that? Okay, I'm going to give you four quick reasons. There was an article in a peer, in an important online magazine called The Conversation. The scientists in that, in an article, said in 2015, they didn't know of a single scientist who thought we could stay under 1.5. This was at the Paris Agreement. Secondly, Chatham House, which is a very respectable think tank, said last year, we're looking at a 1% chance that we're going to stay under 1.5. There was a survey of top world scientists, private survey, 94% of them said we're going over 1.5. So James Hansen, probably the most famous and prestigious climate scientist in the United States, said the idea of staying under 1.5 is now unadulterated bullshit. So we're going over 1.5, right? We can stop on that one. So what this video is about is stopping things between 1.5 and 2 degrees. Because at 2 degrees, the really bad news is not this. The really bad news is at 2 degrees, according to another of the world's top leading scientists, Johan Rostrom, director of the Potsdam Institute, at two degrees, we're very likely to have triggered various feedbacks in the global geophysical system and we'll be going over three. And if we go over three, guess what? We're going to go over four, right? And four is half of the world uninhabitable. So incidentally, at three degrees in this paper, we're looking at 2,000 million refugees. So what this video is about is, is a new angle on what needs to happen in order to stop it. Now, there's lots of people who will say it's impossible to stop it. And they've got a good reason for saying that. There's lots of good science which says, suggests we're definitely going over two. There will be people, of course, who say maybe we've got you know, a little bit more of a chance. Maybe you can go up to 2.5 and we'll be okay. But the important thing to understand here is these are all estimates, like putting your children or young people on a plane at 5%. It's an estimate. The real issue, of course, is you don't want to put them on the plane. We don't want to be going here, do we? I mean, 1,000 million refugees, that's 200 Ukraines, right? At the end of World War II, there was 50 million refugees. There was a massive international crisis. This is 20 World War Twos in terms of refugees. You see what I'm saying? This is off the chart. This is the final death project. So I want to just quote from Sir David King. And he's the former chief scientific advisor to the British government. So we've heard from James Hansen, the top scientist in the United States, Johan Rostrom, top scientist in Europe, arguably. And now we're going to hear from the top scientist in this country, arguably, Sir David King. So what he says is we have to act quickly. What we do in the next three to four years will determine the future of humanity. He said that last year. So let's do some basic math, shall we? That gives us three years, maybe two and a half years, maybe three and a half years. So this video is looking at what we have to do. 
I'm just going to leave you with the final sort of thing that came out last week, which is uh, James Hansen produced a memo saying we're actually going to go over the 1.5 in 2024. 2024. Because of something called the El Nino effect and you can look it all up. So this is real. We all know it's real. And the big question is, what are we going to do? Okay, so before I like get into the main themes of this video, I just want to point something out. I don't know if you've noticed, but I haven't actually talked about climate change. I haven't talked about the climate crisis. And the reason I've done that is because as soon as we use those words, we're basically falling into what you might call the corporate frame. I don't know if you know, but the phrase climate change was created by people from the big corporations for a specific reason. And that specific reason is to make, make this situation look like something technical, something that's a problem, something that's physical, like bad weather. There's bad weather happening. That's not what the situation is. Okay, so let's look at this. Here's an axe, and the axe goes into the head. The axe goes into the head. So here's a physical thing, the axe, and here's a physical thing, the head. This is a bit weird, isn't it? But this is what climate change says. It says, here's the climate, and it creates a change in the head. You see how that works? But what really happened was Mr. Jones murdered Mrs. Harris. That's a different way of looking upon it, isn't it? It's like Mr. Jones used an ax to put into the head of Mrs. Harris. And obviously that was murder. So this is why this video is called the final death project, because there's a death project by Mr. Jones to kill Mrs. Harris. Or in terms of what's going on with the climate, Mr. Jones is using the climate to murder Mrs. Harris. The corporate class, the elites, knowingly and willingly are putting carbon into the atmosphere which murders billions of people, creates hundreds of millions of refugees. And that's just for starters. So that's why I'm suggesting if we're going to understand what to do about this final death project, we have to call a spade a spade, as they say where I'm from, in Manchester in the UK. It's like the guy murdered her. The corporate elite is murdering people in the global south, the next generation and all the rest of it. So notice something else that's going on there. We're not saying, we're not saying we, we are creating the climate crisis. We're pointing to Mr. Jones, right? The village where Mr. Jones lives may have had a certain amount of complicity. They may have looked the other way, but fundamentally it was Mr. Jones that murdered Mrs. Harris. So the global elite, knowingly and willingly, is engaging in murder of other people with a certain amount of complicity from the rest of the population. So just to take a few historic examples, in 1941, according to Tim Snyder, a scholar of the Holocaust, the Germans went into the Ukraine with the intention of wiping out, murdering, slaughtering 30 million Slavs to depopulate the Ukraine so Germans could enhance their supposed destiny to dominate Europe and be the master race. 
So what the global capitalist elite is doing is saying, in order to maintain our power, in order to maintain our hegemony, as you might say, we have to dispose of these people, the poor and vulnerable, through putting carbon into the atmosphere. For the next 10,000 generations, you can guarantee people won't be talking about axes and heads. They're going to be talking about Mr. Jones and Mrs. Harris, obviously, right? So we need to sort of get that into our heads, as you might say, before we take the next step. Okay, so if you're new to this sort of thing, and I know many of you watching this video aren't, but whether you're new or not, the reason I'm starting off with this is because it's a total bombshell. And whether you're familiar with what's going on or not, in order to understand our responsibilities, you have to understand viscerally what's happening. You have to understand that thousands of millions of people are going to be displaced. Hundreds of millions of people are going to die. Tens of millions of people are going to be raped. That's the first thing. The second thing is, this is happening because a group of people have decided they want it to happen in order to pursue their material interests, their greed, their pathological hatred of life. Call it what you will. But it's a conscious decision. So the third thing I want to look at before we actually get into the heart of the video, is to just focus on how this utterly violates every human value. It violates our commitment to all the generations that came before us. They fought and died for liberty, for freedom, for prosperity. And according to Sir David King, we're gonna throw that away unless we act in the next three years. We're completely violating our responsibility to our children, not just our children, but the next 10,000 generations, because this is going to go on forever, okay? Once the Arctic's melted, it's gone forever. So we're condemning the next 10,000 generations, for the sake of argument, to hell. As a London lawyer told me, there is no greater crime. It's the worst possible situation imposed on the maximum number of people going on effectively for other. It's a complete violation of our responsibilities to those that came before us and those that have come after us. Or you can look at it another way. It's a complete violation of our commitment to our families, to maintain our families, to look after them, to protect them. It's a complete violation of our communities, our villages, our towns, that are going to be destroyed. It's a complete violation of our commitment to our countries, our nations, our states. It's treasonous, technically and morally, to destroy your country. That's what's going on. This is our country. The ax is going in to our country, our communities, our families, according to peer-reviewed science, according to the world's experts. And even bigger than that, we're destroying the whole of nature. We're destroying the whole of the world forever. I'd like to suggest, and there's different ways of looking upon this, okay? But I'd like to suggest that there's something fundamental here. And the fundamental is about rights. And we can look at this in different ways, but for the upshot is, the upshot of is, is 
Do people have rights or don't they? Do people have rights to a livelihood? Do people have rights to a life? Do people have a right to destroy other people's livelihoods? And do they have the right to kill and slaughter people? So in many traditions, there's the notion of the moral law, which is do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. But there's a modern conception as well, which is you don't get to kill people because people have rights and those rights are what's called inalienable. In other words, they're non-negotiable. And if you witness the violation of these fundamental rights, the idea and also the emotion is you have to stop that. That's not a right, it's a duty. So what I want you to do is watch the rest of this video. Because I'm going to be going, I'm going to be going through how this is going to be stopped. Okay, so that was the introduction. Um, that's the initial drama, as you might say. Um, I'm just going to say a little bit about myself. Because one question might be, well, who is this guy? Why should we listen to Roger Hallam? Very good question. Might want to listen to someone else. <laughs> In so much as you should listen to me, it's because I spent my whole life studying radical political change. It's been my lifetime's obsession. That's what I think about <clears throat> when I get up in the morning, when I go to sleep at night. For better or worse, that's what I do. So I've been organising people since I was about 13. I was involved in the peace movement in the 1980s. Uh, I dropped out of university to study, study Gandhi's non-violence. I've been organising people in many different campaigns. I spent five years uh, doing research at King's College in London on non-violence and civil disobedience and <clears throat> how to bring about political change. Um, more specifically, I did the strategic design for Extinction Rebellion um, for April 2019. I produced like the paper around that and, you know, with a little bit of persuasion, obviously other people were involved as well, um, lots of other people, but that changed the conversation in the UK and around the world. In 2022, I designed a plan to um, challenge the government over insulation, which is the biggest no-brainer thing to do in terms of reducing carbon emissions. Uh, the plan I came up with was to block motorways. 150 people did that last year in August, September, October. It went from zero to 80% name recognition in two weeks, the fastest name recognition campaign in British history. 270 national news articles, I think dozens of TV interviews, millions of conversations. Now insulation is, you know, one of the main four or five environmental issues in the UK. There's articles in the Times saying, you know, Insulate Britain was right, surprise, surprise, you know, with the cost of living crisis. This year I've been involved in designing and mobilising for Just Stop Oil, which is at the time of doing this video, the biggest climate campaign in the UK just this week. Tens of millions of people have seen videos uh, about um, Just Up Oil with various actions it's ha it's, that's happening. Over 1,500 people have been arrested, getting on for 100 people have been to prison. Okay, so that's me, right? And a lot of what I'm going to be talking about, obviously, is going to be standing on the shoulders of giants and what I've gathered from other designers and activists around the world. So this is like a collective effort, but it's coming through me for, for better or worse. And needless to say, what I'm going to say to you is going to be necessarily incomplete. So feel free to produce your own videos, which, you know, give different nuances and ideas around it, or simplify this video, improve the graphics. You know, you don't need to ask me. People email me after vid uh, videos and say, you know, can we do this, that and the other? Yeah, just do it, right? Yeah, just get the, the word out there. This is like what you might call an ecology of discovery. You know, lots of people are discovering and developing different things. Okay, so we're going to get on to the heart of what this video is about, which is, you know, disrupting the public. Why disrupt the public? What's the 
ethical reasons for that, what's the strategic reasons for it, uh, and what have you. And what I want to do is do a two-part analysis, as you might say. I'm going to look at what you might call a conventional analysis based upon what you might call self-interest. And I'll explain more about this in a minute. So I'm going to go through that in terms of you know, ethics and strategy. But then, arguably more interestingly, I'm going to throw all that to one side and do another analysis, which is going to look at the mass psychology, this thing called the public, and draw on older and wider traditions of thought on what exactly happens if we're going to be more honest with ourselves. So it's a two-step approach, what you might call a materialist approach, and then a post or non-materialist approach. And bear with me, okay? This is important. In fact, I would say that trying to move over to a more sophisticated, empirically robust, non-material approach of how human beings act is absolutely fundamental to our success. And this is what I'm going to be trying to elucidate, as they say. And it is going to be quite a long video. So feel free to watch it in sections, you know, come back tomorrow. I've split it into different bits. And if you're going to be complaining, some people complain about long video. So the situation is, is and I know this sounds a bit weird, but it's that 10, 20% of people that get to the end of the video who I'm focusing on because this stuff is complicated. I can't summarise in five minutes, it's just going to make me sound like an idiot. I need a good half hour, hour to go through it step by step, okay? And the other thing is, is it's those 10, 20% of you who are going to finish the video who are going to save the world, potentially. So, for instance, like I did a video called um, How to Stop the Climate Crisis in Six Months, right? 50, 60,000 people watched it. Those, the people that got to the end... I'd say about 30, 50 people emailed me. And they're the people that have now created the biggest climate crisis, death project campaigns around the Western world. So it's all up to you guys, dare I say it. Okay. So let's get in the, into the heart of this video. Why disrupt the public? We've dealt with the initial proposition, as you might say, the initial reality. We're facing a death project. Why disrupt the public? So let's just start with a bit of traditional analysis, as you might say, which is let's take the idea of disruption. So I want to start here with an example of my own civil disobedience. So about four years ago, I went in to a big Gothic hall in King's College, the Central Hall, with some other students. And for about five minutes, we put paint all around the Central Hall, sprayed it on the walls. It was about seven, ten thousand pounds worth of damage. Unsurprisingly, about a year later, um, I was in Crown Court, a British Crown Court, with a jury. And my argument, <clears throat> my argument was I had engaged in criminal damage, but in British common law, the actual charge was criminal damage without lawful excuse. They don't usually add that little bit on. So my argument was there's no dispute that I went into King's College. This was not a who did it, right, trial. I did it. The video was there. I said I did it. King's College said I did it. No one was disputing that the disruption happened. The disruption happened. The argument was the disruption was justified. Okay? It had a lawful excuse. And my argument was we didn't go into King's College to just engage in vandalism, you know, as an end in itself. We went into King's College's Gothic Central Hall to cause disruption in order to persuade the college, 
to divest from fossil fuels. In other words, we cause disruption to prevent greater disruption. And to cut a long story short, the jury went out for 45 minutes, which I think is the shortest time possible, came back in and unanimously found myself, my other co-defendant, not guilty on all counts of criminal damage. So what I'm trying to say here is the fundamental understanding, the fundamental move is to understand disruption in and of itself is not bad, it's not illegal. It's only bad, it's unethical, it's only illegal if it doesn't have a good excuse, if it's not lawful in other words. So now once we've established that, which dare I say is a bit of a no-brainer, right? People disrupt people all the time, <laughs> doesn't mean it's illegal, depends why. Um, then we can start to, you know, get into this disrupting the public business. So just to summarise, the point here is what's called in English common law the right of necessity. Now there's all sorts of legal, you know, minutiae about this, but the fundamental point is if it's necessary to prevent some massive harm, some evil, some illegality, some immorality is justified, you have a right of necessity to cause harm. You have the right of necessity to cause disruption because something terrible is happening. So the classic example of this in English common law is the Great Fire of London. You know, there's fires coming across the city. You've got to knock down these houses to cause a break you go into the house, you don't ask permission. You knock the house down because you've got half an hour to knock the house down. That's disruption. That's major disruption. And it's absolutely justifiable in law because otherwise the whole city is going to burn down. Now, the right of necessity is sort of the legal moral principle for an individual and an institution, let's say, or an individual and another individual. You know, you're in the pub, someone's about to stab someone, you push the person over you in order to prevent someone being stabbed. It's that sort of realm. But it also applies on the level of the criminality of a group or of a regime. So this goes back to this guy called John Locke, just a you know, use a bit of political philosophy here. So what John Locke was saying, and dare I say the whole of the Western liberal radical socialist left tradition for the sake of argument, says that if the ruling class or if a state or if a regime or if a group of people are arbitrarily engaging in the destruction of the lives and livelihoods of others, in other words, just doing it for their own greed, their own interest, for no good reason other than their own, their own desires, let's put it like that. Then you have the right of revolution. Now technically the right of revolution means you can engage in systematic disruption of that society in order to prevent a systematic macro level crime. And everyone knows this, right? You know, if you have a dictator in the global south and people engage in civil resistance and they go to the capital city, anyone with modern secular values is going to go, yeah, fair enough. You know, this dictator is murdering people in order to maintain power. You have the right to overthrow that regime. And I just want to reference like just war theory, right? So this is like an older idea, but I don't want to get in a big discussion about violence and war and what have you. But the point is, is the whole of the Western tradition and arguably many other traditions says that if a nation comes and destroys your nation, you have the right of self-defense. That's about as fundamental as you can get. Um, so if you think this is like a bit theoretical, let's take two examples about 
the final DEF project we're talking about here. So if we go over 1.5, we effectively guarantee the obliteration of the small island states because of sea level rise. It's locked in. So one of the ministers, I think a cop, said, you might as well come and bomb us. In other words, what he was saying was, the elites, the global north, western world elites primarily, who have historic responsibility for putting carbon into the atmosphere, are engaging in an act of war. They are engaging in the murder and disruption, destruction of other sovereign states. It doesn't matter that the mechanism is a bit novel, you know, that they're not using knives. When people used to use gunpowder, they didn't say, well, it's gunpowder, it's not knives. When people used bombs, they didn't say, well, it's not gunpowder, it's bombs. When people, you know, dropped an atomic bomb and it was radiation rather than, you know, a conventional blast. No, the mechanism of murder, the mechanism of destruction is not the issue. It's the causality. It's I put carbon into the atmosphere and you're going to die. Your country is going to die. That's completely within the definition of what justifies a just war. In other words, in a modern conception, justifies civil resistance, disruption. And I'll just leave this section on a quote from the Sudanese ambassador at the COP, I think it was, or big conference, Copenhagen in 2009. So he got into a lot of trouble for telling this truth, but it's totally logical, which is he was saying, if, you, if the Western world continues to put carbon into the atmosphere, then you are sending my people, the Sudanese people, into the furnaces. So obviously there's a reference to the Holocaust here. But it's undeniable, right? There's some people, they're putting carbon into the atmosphere. It leads to the destruction of Sudan. One of the first countries that will become uninhabitable because of its geographical position in the Sahel. It was perfectly right. So the point here, the first point we need to accept is disruption can be justified. The question is not, is it justified or isn't it justified, but rather, when is it justified? When is it justified? You know, as a final point, think about World War II. No one argues that disrupting the Nazi regime wasn't justified, right? Things are often justified. The key question is, is, is it? And what's the criteria of something being justified. What's the criteria for disrupting the public? Okay, so let's take the next step, which is, is disruption justified? Well, that begs a question, doesn't it? Which is, is it proportionate? I mean, there's disruption and then there's disruption, okay? So let's just, getting our heads into this with a few examples. So, you know, you get in a car in the morning. There's a tiny possibility that a child is going to run out into the road. You can't deny that possibility. Um, you can't deny that you could cause a massive disruption. You could cause injury to that child. You could even kill that child. You can't deny that that's an impossibility. But you feel like you're justified to do it because, well, you've got to get to work, you know, you've got to live your life. You can't be a total absolutist about things morally. But there is that tiny possibility. So in other words, you're saying, I'm justified in getting into my car in the morning because the probability of this happening is really tiny. Okay, let's assume that's fair enough. So let's look at a demonstration like, you know, 100, 200 years ago in many countries, demonstrations were really legal. And then there was, you know, what you might call the progress of democratic culture. And people said, no, P 
people have a right to disrupt through a demonstration because that's part of democracy. People need to be able to express themselves. And the downside of that is, you know, you're sitting in a taxi and you can't get to where you want to go because 10,000 people are protesting about something in the street. Now that right is not obvious, you know, we're definitely disrupting people, but the argument is, is it's proportionate because we live in a democracy and people need to express themselves and there's these routine issues and it's valid to disrupt the general public uh, to have a demonstration. And let's not delude ourselves, okay? It, you know, in the worst possible analysis, there's an ambulance that can't get to hospital, you know, there's someone whose funeral, they missed their funeral because there was a big demonstration. But society has decided, at least democratic society has decided, yeah, you know, if you're going to have a, dis uh, a demonstration, then fair enough. And incidentally, I experienced this myself about half a year ago. I was trying to get to a train station in, in Brussels, I think it was. There was this big demonstration and I, I missed my train. <laughs> I missed my train. And a little bit of me was going, oh, you know, demonstrations. And then obviously I realised I was a little bit hypocritical. <laughs> and I said, no, you know, that's the cost of living in a democratic society. So just moving, you know, along a little bit, let's take a strike. So again, you know, in different countries, strikes were illegal. And in some countries it took a good, you know, decade or two to get the right to strike. And in some countries it's under, under debate. But the point is, the argument is, is workers have the right to strike. In other words, they have the right to cause disruption to the public and to society because the greater good, the justification, is that you've got the power of the employers, the bosses, the employer, the power of capital, and the counterbalance to that is the collective withdrawal of labour. And an unintended consequence of that is, you know, the general public can't get to work in the morning. So, for instance, like the tube drivers, I'll talk more about the tube drivers. They go on strike, it's legal, everyone's pissed off, welcome to a democratic society, you know. Conflict happens, it's in a relatively ordered way, it's proportionate. You know, the tube drivers aren't going around shooting anyone, they're just refusing to drive the tube. Everyone accepts it in a sort of grudging way. I'll just give you a last example, which is in Serbia, um, I think it was before Christmas, about 20,000 people went on the motorways. They went on the motorways because the government, which arguably is quite corrupt, had said to big multinationals, corporations, they've got a free hand to dig up minerals in Serbia. And a significant minority of the Serbian population went, nope, you know, we are going to express ourselves we're going to engage in democratic disruption, as it were. We're going to go onto the motorways and within two weeks, the government agreed, or at least they submitted to that popular demand. You know, most people in Serbia didn't want it to happen. That was manifested through closing the motorways. Closing the motorways, if you hadn't noticed, causes massive disruption. No one's disputing that. No one's disputing that I threw paint over King's College. That's not the issue. The issue, is was it justified? And that means, was it proportionate? So arguably, it was proportionate for the Serbian population to counteract the power of international capital, international corporations with people power going onto those motorways. Even though, let's say, 20, 50, 100,000 people couldn't, couldn't get on the motorway, they couldn't get to work, they couldn't go and see their parents, they couldn't go to funerals. Maybe a few people couldn't get to hospital. But that's the cost of living in an open democratic state. That's the reality. OK, so we've looked at proportionality. Disruption is justified as long as it's proportionate. Let's look at a slightly different angle, which is, is it justified in relation to people's interests and whose interests. In other words, what people are you affecting and they do they have a say in, in, what's, in what goes on? So let me just start with uh, 
John Stuart Mill. So most people will go along with this idea. Yeah, what he said, and obviously he was repeating what people have been saying for thousands of years, but his basic proposition was, you can do whatever you like, as long as you don't, you know, undermine the interests of other people. Um, and then that's connected with the idea, well, how do you enforce that? You know, I mean, I want to disrupt that person's interests. How do I get stopped? So a central idea of democracy is, is the way we stop people doing bad things is the people who are affected, the people whose self-interested are affected, have a say in the decision. Seems a good idea. So, for instance, there's this like old idea of no taxation without representation. So it's not that democracy in itself is like, you know, a good thing. It's, it's good for a particular reason which is it enables people who are affected by decisions to have a say in whether that goes ahead. OK, so when all this was worked out, you know, 300 years ago at the beginning of modern democracy, it was like you'd have a state and you have the citizens in the state and the state would engage in activities and everyone would have representation in that state's decision-making institutions like the parliament. And that's all well and good. But there was a big problem with it. And now there's an even bigger problem with it, which is this. OK, so this is quite an interesting and pivotal part of this video. We've got the government. The government has to reflect the interests of the people. Concretely, that means living voters in the country, okay? Everyone's familiar with that. There's the electorate. These people are alive, they're voting, and they determine the government of the country because no representation without taxation, no disrupting our interests unless we have a say. Fair enough. But there's a little bit of a problem, traditionally this problem. What about slaves? So as everyone knows, you know, in this country, UK, we had lots of slaves in colonial lands. They, their interests weren't reflected in government policy. So the proposition was, well, they're going to be affected by government policy. Number one, they need to not be slaves. And number two is they need a vote. Otherwise, you contradicted the whole principle of democracy. But more broadly speaking, you've got the colonial people's situation, which is these are the people voting in Europe, you know, in France or the UK, but the colonial peoples don't have any say, but they're being affected. So the colonial peoples say, well, we should have a vote, or what they did decide, of course, is they were going to create their own countries where they could express their interests. So there's lots of, you know, could talk about this for hours, but everyone's familiar with this problem and a lot of people are familiar with the history, which is got rid of slavery, at least in its traditional forms, and colonial peoples got independence because of this fundamental principle, right? Which is, if you're going to disrupt my interests, I have to have a say. I have to have a say in it. But the broader sort of, the broader metaphysical problem, as you might say, is in the good old days, people would affect the interests only of living people, right? You could go and kill people, but you couldn't lock in the killing of people 200 years down the line. At least traditionally, before we had slaves in colonial situation, you could kill people in your country, but you couldn't go off and kill people halfway around the world. So this was good, but it was limited to the time, the historical period it was thought about. So we had this traditional problem over the last two or three hundred years, but now we've got an even bigger problem, which is now we have the power to disrupt the interests of the next generations. Because 
when we put carbon into the atmosphere and when the Arctic's melted, the Arctic is going to be melted for the next 100,000 years. So you're going to affect the interests of the next 10,000 generations, let's say. So do they have a say? Well, obviously, if you agree with, you know, common sense, these people, the corporations that control the government and the, pe the people of that country, the public, don't get to kill the next 10,000 generations, do they? Obviously not. And then there's another problem, which is with nature. So nature doesn't have a vote, you can't notice. And you might say, well, the traditional attitude is nature's inert, it's just stuff, you know, it's mining, it's agriculture, let's go out and plunder and rape the land because it doesn't have any interests, right? It's just dead. That's the traditional alienated view, as you might say, of the natural world. But there's something sort of interesting going on, which is, what exactly is nature? Well, arguably, it's our kids, isn't it? Because they're animals, they're physical beings in the space of nature. So we can start destroying nature, but if we destroy nature, we destroy our kids. So don't, doesn't nature have some rights? Not least because it should in and of itself, because animals are sentient beings, for instance. You know, a billion animals died in the, in the Australian forest fires two or three years ago. So nature has rights in itself, but certainly our kids are supposed to have rights. And then more sort of subversively, what about our bodies? Our bodies are part of nature. It's blood and flesh, right? So if we engage in the destruction of nature, we destroy the natural world, we destroy animals, we destroy plants, we destroy those animals called our children, and then we destroy those bodies that are bodies. In other words, ecological collapse leads to a whole range of destructions of our own bodies. And you know what I'm talking about, which is COVID. So you have ecological stress that leads to disease, it leads to you know, all sorts of things that affect our individual bodies and kill our bodies. And you haven't noticed, if you kill our body, you kill the voter. So that's what you might call the political theory of interests, okay? Which is at the heart of our culture. And I just want to point to another sort of deeper proposition, which is the notion of absolute rights. So I've touched on this, but just to finish off on this, we have the notion of absolute rights. And that notion is you don't destroy people's livelihoods and you don't destroy people's life. It doesn't matter how much money you're going to make out of murdering people. It doesn't matter how much, you know, greed you have, how much your ideology is saying, you know, those people, those Jews or those Slavs or those black people, you don't have the right to kill them in order to propagate your ideology, your belief system, your self-interest. You can, you know, you can push those interests, but they have a limit. And the proposition is that limit is livelihood. You can't destroy people's livelihoods and you can't kill them. You can't engage in the final death project. So two examples of this are, you know, the German population in 1933 voted in Hitler. It was democratic. The people decided to vote in a Nazi government. But according to absolute rights, yes, they could decide to grow, you know, build motorways, they could decide to support farmers, but they couldn't decide to kill Jews because that transgressed a fundamental rights and the fundamental rights trump democracy right trump actual living democracy a particular vote by a particular group of people so another example is when the germans invaded not you know the french republic there was 
the Vichy regime, the Vichy regime, decided they were going to facilitate and arguably promote the deportation of the Jews and, you know, various other undesirables, as it were. They didn't have the right to do that. The French population did not have the right to undermine the fundamental rights of other human beings. And that's what the French resistance did. The French resistance was not formally democratic in that formal sense, because most of the voters in Vichy France didn't want the French resistance. Well, the French resistance was saying, we don't care, because what we're dealing with here is absolute evil. What we're dealing with here is a death project. What we're dealing with here is deporting people to kill them. So what we're dealing with here is the global elites organising the mass destruction of billions of livelihoods. That's what a refugee is, someone who's lost their livelihood. And as a knock-on effect of that, they're organising the mass murder, the final death project of the human race. Okay, so we've set ourselves up here for like the final part of this materialist, rationalist, as you might say, justification for disrupting the public. Um, we've looked at, well, we've established that disruption is in principle justified because of what it prevents, right? That's a no-brainer. Secondly, we said, well, it, it needs to be proportionate. It needs to be you know, a demonstration is a proportionate response to a normal political issue. It disrupts, but it's justified because it's proportionate. And then we've sort of analysed proportionality with a bit of more sort of detail, which is proportionate to whose interests. Yes, it's, you know, we're promoting the interests of the voters, we can cause disruption. But in the modern context with the final death project, when the corporate elite is engaged in killing people outside the country and people for the next 100,000 years, then we're going to be fundamentally hypocritical and morally stupid if we don't say these people have rights, just as people in the past were morally stupid and just irrational if they said, yeah, these people have got interests, but these people don't, excuse me, the slaves have interests, colonial peoples have interests, right? So it's a no-brainer, right? These people need to be in the frame. So we've, we've said it's proportionate, we've said it's justified in terms of the interests. The final section is, is it, is it effective? Uh, does it actually do the job? Does it actually promote the interests of, of all these people by disrupting the public? So what's quite interesting is I'm making this video, I think it's, yeah, it is, isn't it? It's the day after, um, two women threw paint over the sunflowers painting of Van Gogh. Now what's interesting is on the same day, they sprayed short or spray painted the uh, police headquarters, a big sign of police headquarters. Now, let's do a little bit of effectiveness right, analysis. I think that something like 50 million people have watched the sunflower painting being covered with soup, okay? Incidentally, there's glass in front of it. So, you know, when we're doing proportionality analysis, there's glass, there's soup, 50 million people watched it. With the um, police headquarters, I don't know how many people watched it, but it's not that many. So what the proposition here is, and it's undeniable, which is disrupting the public, disrupting the, uh, something that has cultural meaning for the public, like an icon, like a statue, or a painting, or a sports event, creates a massive amount of eyeballs. Now, I'm not saying those, all that attention necessarily leads to promoting the interests of these people. But what I am saying is, and this is obvious, unless you attract the attention of millions of people, you don't get in the ballpark of creating that social and cultural change. So disrupting the public is justified, disrupting the meaning systems of the public, or directly uh, disrupting the public, is justified if it creates a massive amount of publicity. 
In other words, the means justify the ends. Now, some people are a bit tricky about this phrase, the means justifies the end, but everyone accepts this on some level. You know, having a demonstration, the means justifies the ends of some level of disruption. When you're dealing with the final death project for the next 10,000 generations, when you're dealing with the destruction of nature, when you're dealing with the global south, obviously it's justified to create 50 million hits by throwing soup over a piece of glass in front of a Van Gogh. Dare I say, I think Van Gogh would probably agree. Um, so that's like just, you know, one, one example, but let's, let's look more systematically at it. Okay, so the general rule here is disrupting the public is more effective than disrupting bad people, okay? That's like an undeniable empirical reality, and I'll give you lots of evidence in a minute. Now, we shouldn't confuse whether you like it or not. That's another matter. You can say the disruption is bad, but you can't deny its effectiveness, assuming there's enough evidence. So let's separate those two things out, because a lot of people say, well, you know, that disruption is ineffective because I don't like it. It's perfectly possible for you not to like it. You might not like soup being thrown over a Van Gogh painting, but that's totally different from whether it's effective or not. You know, if you're getting stuck in traffic with that demonstration, you might not like the demonstration, but it's certainly nothing to do with whether that demonstration is going to be effective. At least that's the, the argument. So I'll give a broader example is with Just Stop Oil and Insulate Britain, when Insulate Britain blocked the motorways, you know, it was all over the national news, uh, literally, you know, 270 news articles, 80% of the British public knew about it, millions of conversations, millions of people hated it, and it was very effective because six months later, insulation was a major talking point. Everyone accepted insulation was essential to deal with the cost of living crisis, the climate crisis, and the right-wing press was saying, actually, Insulate Britain was right all along. Now, that's a standard, like, routine of disruption. Disruption happens, people don't like it, and then people agree it was a good idea. Because it was a good idea, because it rationally was looking after the interests of our children and our bodies and other essential things. So there's two things going on here, right? There's the publicity, and obviously the publicity can be bad publicity, but it doesn't matter because you're causing material disruption. And it's the material disruption of disrupting the public which often pushes through. So for instance, the classic example here, as I've mentioned, is, is tube drivers. Right, I don't know how much tube drivers get paid, but I'm assuming, you know, it's, let's say 70, 80,000, it's a lot of money compared to other workers. Why is that? Because they can disrupt the public legally. They say, we're not going to drive the tube trains. A lot of the public hate that. A lot of the public think it's fair enough, of course, and arguably it is and arguably it's not. The point is, is the reason their interests are being promoted is because of effective disruption. So it's a means and ends argument. So when we disrupt the public on the motorway, the public or many of the public might not like it, and we'll talk about this in more detail in a minute, but it causes like massive publicity and massive disruption. And that takes you over a tipping point where a government will, will talk to you. So I'm going to give you a few examples, and there's hundreds of examples, okay? But the famous example, as, as some of you watching this video probably know, is the Freedom Riders in 1961. So a small number of black and white people got on the buses, uh, got on a bus going to Alabama, the Deep South, where it was illegal, at least as far as Alabama was concerned, and they were beaten up, their coach was set on fire, um, they were thrown into prison. Three days later, 24 students, I think, from Atlanta set off, and then from then on, 10, 20, 30 people got on the buses and came down to Alabama to challenge this, you know, obscene injustice that black and white people couldn't even sit on a bus together, right? 
There was massive disruption and there was intense disruption. So although nowadays, like no one in their right mind is going to say, well, that was a bad campaign because obviously it was justified because the essential interests of, of black people were being violated. But the fact of the matter is, you know, we don't talk about this nowadays, but what about the people on the bus? When the bus was set on fire, there were passengers on the bus who potentially could have been killed, right? At least they escaped from the bus. No one was killed, but obviously they were extremely unhappy about it. Their interests were definitely like, you know, transgressed. When they were in the, uh, in the waiting room of the bus station, this big bus station, there were hundreds of people there, the white mob came in and beat people up. They beat people up who were just innocent bystanders, right? Some guy came out of the toilet, for instance, black guy, and he got beaten up. Um, think about all the people who wanted to travel that day. I mean, let's say there was 10,000 people who were trying to go about their lawful business being disrupted. It was all justified. All that disruption was justified in order to get the eyeballs, the attention of the population to say black and white people sitting on the bus is not a bad thing. It's a good thing, right? And it's a violation of essential rights. And everyone now goes agrees, right? So this has happened over and over again, no, not least in the civil rights movement. So, for instance, two years later, about 5,000 children, people under 18, were in the city centre, you know, demanding their rights. And the police came along with dogs and, um, you know, water cannon, you name it. And these kids were blown against the wall. And after seven days, it was successful. And everyone, it's an iconic moment in civil rights history and global history where, you know, black people stood up for their rights. Everyone thinks it was justified because the fundamental rights were being violated. But, like, children ended up in hospital. Uh, no doubt some of them were traumatised. The public, the whole of the central centre of the city was closed down. Um, people couldn't go about their rightful business. It was terrible for these people. But the general public was disrupted because it was justified, because it was effective. Because within eight days, you know, the city government decided to enter the negotiations. Um, another more recent example is with ACT UP, there were lots of gay people in New York and other cities that were dying because the state governments didn't care about gay people. They were second-class citizens at best. You know, they were subhuman at worst. People hated gay people in the 1980s. And Larry Kramer came along and he said, right, we're not going to just sit on committees. We're going to cause disruption. And within six months, the whole atmosphere changed from neglect, complacency, being ignored, and the causal factor was public disruption. So they went to the stock exchange, closed down the stock exchange. What was the stock exchange to do with gay rights? Like, ostensibly, nothing at all. But it was justified because people's essential lie, right to a life was being violated. They went to the Catholic cathedral. All those people, those innocent, you know, Catholic people were going to their service. They couldn't get in there. It was mayhem. It was justified. Right? This is what democracy looks like. Right? People protest in order to pursue their interests. And if we're going to be consistent in this principle, this universal principle of our cultures, then we've got to stand up for the rights of these people and the rights of nature. Otherwise, it's just entirely inconsistent. We're entirely hypocritical. And not more than that, we're just murderously cruel. So it's justified. So just in case you're thinking, you know, in this modern example of people sitting on motorways and what have you, yes, you break through. You break through when there's enough people doing it. It's as simple as that. So just as with the tube drivers, you know, if 10% of them went on strike, nothing would happen. If 60%, 70% of them go on strike, they hit a tipping point, i.e. this binary where you negotiate or you don't negotiate. So some people, for instance, that I'm associated with, you know, sat in the motorway in British Columbia to stop old growth. You know, 80% of the population agrees. Cutting down trees in 2022 is like beyond mad. Um, 
they sat on the motorways for several days and then they had uh, private talks with the chief of staff of the British Columbia government. In other words, if 300 people were sat on that motorway, they would have won. In other words, this is entirely effective. It's entirely effective because it disrupts the public. Because disrupting the public creates the publicity. And the publicity creates the political pressure. And the political pressure produces the win that creates people getting their interests fulfilled. According to traditional political theory, right? Left-wing people agree with this, right-wing people agree with this. So just to summarise this point about effectiveness, this little diagram shows how this works, which is when you have an opponent and you increase the pressure, there is always a point where the opponent will negotiate. Right? It might be here, it might be here, it might be here. This is the amount of pressure you're putting onto the opponent. And it's a binary, right? They decide, broadly speaking, they're not negotiating, and then they negotiate. And this is a point in space, right? In time and space. So, for instance, as I've said, with the two drivers, you know, 10% of them go on strike. Nope, they're not going to negotiate. 70% of them go on strike. Yep, they're going to negotiate, right? It's material pressure. It's means and ends. They're justified in their claim. They force it through, through disruption of the public. Okay, so when you're engaging in disruption of the public, the issue isn't disrupting the public, assuming you're right, and we've talked about that. In terms of effectiveness, you have to disrupt the public to the extent you get to this tipping point, right? So maybe you disrupt the public in Canada for three days, you don't win. If you disrupt the public for four days, you get the meeting with the chief and staff. You see how that works. So this is a means and ends argument, and it's based on the essential proposition that disruption can and often is justified of the public. And it's worth saying that this is not just any issue, right? If people, if people you know, just wanted everyone to wear red hats or something, this negotiation point would be right up here, right? Be off the charts because people would be saying, I don't care about the amount of disruption. We're not going to negotiate. But if, you're, if your objective is fundamentally right, and you can argue whether it's fundamentally objectively right or just right for our society, but engaging in a mass murder of the next 10,000 generations pretty much violates every value system in modern society. So that means this negotiation point is, it might be quite a lot lower because the people know they're wrong. This is, shouldn't be underestimated. It's not like some postmodernist, you know, relativistic thing. It's like, if you're objectively right, then people will come around to your point of view faster than if you're just dealing with your own interests. And if the final death project isn't something that justifies mass disruption, God knows what does. I could finish this video here because I've basically didn't done this line of argument. We're facing a death project. It's justified in disrupting the public, disrupting the public works. But for me, like the most interesting part of this video is what I'm going to say in the next 15, 20 minutes or whatever, which is, it's not really like that. Or at least there's a different way of looking upon what we're talking about here. So we've sort of said, look, you know, the public have got rights. They've got a right not to be disrupted, but it's not an absolute right. There's a means to an end, which is if there's a massive moral issue, if people are losing their rights, then disrupting the public is justified and it's effective. It's a means to an end sort of thing. So when people say, look, you're upsetting the public, you're losing support, it doesn't matter. That's the argument. Because you're going to push through because of material disruption and you're going to win 
and 15 years down the line they're going to be making statues of you you know statues of Mandela Gandhi you know women's rights people in in Parliament Square for instance okay but what I'm going to look at now is just to drill down a little bit into this whole notion that you are upsetting the public right what, what does that actually mean and what I want to suggest is this is an old materialist way of looking upon that this I'm going to use this materialist word you know you can use another word and then there's what I would call a non-materialist or post-materialist way so what I mean by this is in traditional you know politics political science in a sort of discourse to conversation I've just engaged in you have this idea that there's these people and they have interests and you violate those interests and that's a cost and that's it it's out of time it's out of space and that individual is is basically a proxy for an accounting point in other words what I'm saying is is this is at the heart of what you might call the patriarchal capitalistic materialistic mechanistic sort of paradigm that we've had since the 17th century arguably for a lot longer and I don't want to get into a big discussion about when and if and how but I'm not necessarily saying that doesn't have some validity right there's obviously our individuals they obviously do have interest but it's not the only game in town certainly not and there's a whole bunch of ways upon looking at what happens to the public what happens to those individuals in, in, in the public and what happens to the public as, ho as a whole which gives you a quite different view on what's actually really going on and this idea that people are computers accounting machines which go I'm being disrupted that's bad for me so I don't like it yeah that's very much just a starting point it's a it's a naive, it's a simplistic, it's reductive analysis. And if we're really going to understand ethically and, and strategically why disrupting the public is justified and has to be done, then we need to delve a little bit deeper. So a sort of entry point into this new way of looking at things is to think a little bit about the public think about citizens in a democratic state and there's a proposition here which is a pathway into what I'm about to say which is these these people are not passive accounting machines right they are citizens and in traditional political theory a citizen has rights but a citizen also has responsibilities in a democratic state in other words, yes, you have a right to liberty, you have a right to, you know, a prosperous life, you have a right to, as John Stuart Mill says, you know, not to be disrupted by other people for no good reason, but also you have a responsibility, a civic responsibility, to maintain the health of that democratic system. You have to engage in disruption, if needs be, to maintain the whole system. So the old way of looking at this or the sort of material way of looking at this is it's like a cost. You know, you get the benefits and this is the cost. But it's more complicated than that. And I'd like to just, you know, I've sort of said this minutes so ago, but I just want to re-emphasise this idea that a lot of progressive people, liberal people, people on the left, inadvertently use a capitalistic, right-wing, conservative reductive sort of idea we here which is we pretend that people are passive and we pretend that people don't have responsibilities and we pretend that things happen to people and they just do this accounting thing they don't right the whole idea of the progressive tradition is that people have rights they have responsibilities they enjoy those responsibilities because it gives them meaning and such like and they're not just accounting machines they're real living emotional human beings so let's use a few examples here, right? So a pre-modern way of looking at this is, is, and this might sound a little bit peculiar, but let's just you know, look upon it psychologically. There's this archetypal story that 
people leave the path of God, right, in old religious language. In other words, the public is there, but the public don't necessarily always do the good because they leave the pathway of righteousness of the good or of God or whatever language you want to use. So, for instance, you could say, you know, people in France in 1941, they, laugh, they left the pathway of the good, the pathway of God. They lost their way. And they need to reform themselves. They need redemption. They need reformation. They need to be awakened to understand their responsibilities. Okay, because this is not a cost. This is part of their pathway towards wholeness into the path of God and all these other words, right? So we don't need to argue about whether, you know, God exists or all that sort of thing. We're just thinking about this psychologically and acknowledging that this is an archetypal story in, in, in human cultures. People lose their way, they have to be challenged and they're brought back and they benefit from that and they support it. They can see. That's why they build a statue of Gandhi, because they recognise in retrospect that Gandhi was right and he was right to disrupt the British. So that's this cycle of, you know, people getting lost and refinding their way and returning to, to some sort of moral equilibrium and then getting lost again. OK, so a more secular sort of interpretation of this is like in psychotherapy or in therapy, particularly in the Freudian tradition. And again, I don't want to get into all the different bits and pieces on this, but the broad proposition, let's say, is You've got your client, they're sitting there, you know, you're challenging them, you're asking them questions, you're drawing them out. They don't want to talk about this, you know, thing that's going wrong, this block in their life. And then suddenly they go, you know, so I hate my mother. It's true. I hate my mother, you know. And as, the, as a professional psychotherapist or therapist, that's good, right? That's good because what, what that person was repressing, their pain and their wrongdoing or the, the thing, that the, the taboo comes out. And as you probably know, right, the theory is, is once that's come out, then it can be accepted and that person can reintegrate that and they can heal themselves, they can feel better about themselves, they can go uh, across, uh, along through their life without you know, depression or anxiety. Now, obviously, that's a gross simplification. But the point is, is that's a well-established, like, story in, in modern secular culture. And everyone broadly accepts that, you know, this happens and it's viable. Um, OK, so let's look at another two examples. So let's take a family. So families are difficult, are they not? <laughs> relationships are difficult. So it's a standard story in the family that something's going wrong. Everyone's pretending it's not going wrong. Maybe one or two people are raising the issue in a sort of polite way. And then someone explodes. And the explosion isn't particularly pleasant. Maybe they say things which, you know, they don't mean. But we all understand that that is functional in the sense that Unless someone explodes, in, unless someone says, this is so fucked, you know, and there's a big row, then you're not actually going to deal with an issue which is really bad in that family. You know, you don't do it over some little argument, but you do it on, you know, someone's cheating on you or, you know, let's say someone's doing something, you know, violent, you know, hitting at your child, dare I say it, you know, sexual abuse. These are massive issues and they require the creation of disruption in the family. And that disruption creates emotionality and rage and kickback and counter accusations and defensiveness, right? And, you know, not always, but very often that process of interpersonal conflict, the very process of conflict and disruption leads to a resolution. In other words, like people sit down, they talk, you know, to echo the sort of religious interpretation of some redemptive process. Someone says, sorry, I lost my way. 
that was terrible what I did, please forgive me, you know, and there's some resolution emotionally between those two people or within the family or within the small group. And after that's happened, the person says, yes, you know, I hated you challenging me at the time, but I was wrong and I needed a kick. You know? and, and so now I know, you know, thank you very much for challenging me. So you, again, you've got this cycle, right? And this isn't, this isn't to do with some reductive self-interest, not to do with money, it's to do with self-interest. It's to do with, rather, it's to do with your image of yourself as a moral and spiritual and emotional being, someone that needs connection and who is denying that connectivity, let's put it like that. So let's take a final example, which you know brings it more into the political and the social, which is Gandhi's um, sort of analysis. I don't actually know whether Gandhi said this, apparently he didn't, but let's, you know, it's his general print rule of thumb. So he said, you know, when you challenge the public, when you challenge uh, through nonviolent action, you know, first people uh, ignore you. In other words, before you cause disruption, you're just being ignored, right? The environmental movement's been ignored on the climate for 30 years because it's not causing disruption, right? Then he said, when you start off, people laugh at you. You know, in other words, they don't, they're embarrassed and they cover it up through laughing at you because they sort of secretly know you're trying to make an important point, but they don't want to accept that, right? Because they're doing very well, thank you, in this deaf project, you know, they're benefiting from slavery. They go, oh, that's just silly, you know. It won't work, you know. Go back and get a job. Then there's the fight stage. The fight stage is that row in the family. The fight stage is when the prophet gets shot, you know, in biblical stories. Uh, they don't get shot. <laughs> They're going to get a spear through their chest or whatever it is. Um, but you see what I mean, right? The fight stage is where psychologically the opponent's ego is being challenged, their sense of self-worth, their sense of rightness, their sense of being a, a respectable person. This isn't about money. This is about their self-image, you know, who they are. Are they good or are they bad? And people hate being challenged when they're doing something bad, if you hadn't noticed, particularly if it's entrenched, particularly if it's systematic, right? Those sudden racists in America in 1960, no way were they going to change. You know, they had 5,000 years of history on their side, for God's sake, right? The corporate companies that are destroying lives in the global south, they're not going to change because they're making too much money. You know, and they've got a whole ideology of free market economics and all the rest of that. So they're going to fight. But that fight, and Gandhi, I'm sure, would, would use the same analysis, is they're going to fight because they're fighting for this self-image. They're fighting for some psychological, deep psychological reason. And then, of course, Gandhi says, as a result of the fight, right, not despite the disruption, because of the disruption, you win. And you keep going. You know, you block those roads for 10 days rather than five. When you've disrupted them for 10, you break through. You know, all those children going out in 1963, they didn't go out for two days, they went out for eight days. When, when the tube drivers go on strike, they go on strike for three weeks. They don't go on strike for one day. They push through. And that's the point at which the opposition then comes to the table. And as a side, little side issue, that's when you show respect, right? That's when you showed respect to the opponent because that enables them to save face and to make a deal. In the same way as, you know, if you're trying to challenge your teenage your son or whatever, you need to give them a hard time. But then you sit down and you're respectful towards them to re-heal like heal that sort of relationship when you've got them to do something you need them to do. Okay, so to take this one stage further, And this is a little bit of a taboo, I suppose, but really what we're moving towards here is a different conception of the human. A conception of the human which is not about self-interest or only partially or even minimally interested in material self-interest. What 
people really are interested in is love. And what love means is connection. And what connection means is recognition. They need to be connected. They need to have responsibilities to others and they want others to have responsibilities to them. And in modern language, that gives them like mental wellness. It stops them getting mentally ill. So this is like a fundamental reconfiguration, as you might say, of what it is to be a human. A human does not exist on their own. They exist in this network of connections. And this network of connections necessarily involves conflict. Conflict is the mechanism through which those connections are renewed and maintained. So, you know, there's this notion of tough love. With a child, you physically prevent the child from, you know, coming to harm, putting themselves in harm. You say, I love you, and because I love you, I'm going to stop you from doing that. And the, the child is mad with you. But, you know, as we've seen, afterwards, the child knows that they're loved because they know that someone will engage in conflict with them. The engaging in conflict is the sign of love, right? Indifference is the sign of disconnection. It's the sign of like alienation. So everyone knows what I mean, right? On a personal level, because everyone watching this video knows how these dynamics work, right? There's variations on the theme. It doesn't always work and all the rest of it, but we know we're in the, what we're in the ballpark with is we're dealing with real human beings. What's a little bit more interesting is this notion that this happens actually on a social level as well. That society isn't a collection of individuals, right? It's not Margaret's Thatcher's, you know, individuals, there's no society routine. That's just empirically nonsense. All the observations in social science point to this connectivity dynamics, right? And there's, it, there's an older idea, I'll give a few sort of viewpoints on this. So first of all, there's an older, it's like a pre-modern idea. And this is the idea of the chain of being. What that means is, is that a society has a reality over and above the individual. And I'm not saying this is objective, but it's a way of looking at things. And arguably the idea of just looking at the individual is another just a way of looking at things. It's not objective. This is complicated stuff. But this collectivist way of looking at things is saying, look, society is an entity in itself. It's an organic being. It's full of connectivity. And it's full of conflict. And again, it's necessarily full of conflict because it has to renew itself. And all those individuals, they have rights and they have responsibilities, but not in a legalistic sense, but in a, I mean, in a legalistic sense for many people, but also in a psychological sense that people need each other. People need to be challenged in order to maintain the psychological and mental and spiritual and moral health of that community. And that's the role, for instance, of the prophet. It's the role of the radical, right? It's the role of the radical flank. It's to speak the truth and stop that society, you know, herding into some sort of collective delusion, which often happens with societies, which obviously is happening at the present time. Okay, now there's a modern psychological take on this from social science. So I'm just going to, you know, remind you or tell you of two things which are really 101 psychology. Right, the first thing is, is individuals will do what other people around them will do. Like we all think we're like these, you know, islands. This is total nonsense. There's overwhelming evidence that if other people are mad, you'll be mad. If other people are good, you'll be good. If other people are killing people, you'll kill them. You know, don't like to think so, but this is what happens over and over again. And similarly, like, if someone tells you something that's true, but you don't like it and other people don't like it, it doesn't matter how true it is, okay? You're just going to disbelieve it because other people disbelieve it and because you don't like it. In other words, like the collective entity of human beings is fundamentally unstable. It's always, it always it's, it's, it's ending up like 
you know, having no moral compass because people just end up doing whatever other people do or they just end up believing things that other people will, will do. Um, so there needs to be like this constant disruption in this social whole um, to maintain the the to maintain the the health of it. And how this works again in sort of modern observation is this notion of nonlinear dynamics. What that means is is a very small number of people can basically flip society back into or from immorality, from dysfunctionality, right? To, from murder and all the rest of it into a new state. And how this works is, is often it starts off with the freedom riders, right? You know, they're just 12 people and then they grow to several hundred people and 400 people end up in prison and then they win and then that mobilizes like 100,000 people and then you have Selma and Birmingham and then you change the consciousness of the society. And this happens over and over again and these tipping points. So the fundamental point here is very few people, like those hundred people on the motorways uh, with Insulate Britain, they had this massive influence over and above uh, their, their numbers. And there's other tipping points and we can discuss whether that's, you know, three and a half percent of the population or one percent. But the basic principle is a small number of people have this massive influence through, number one, speaking the truth on something objectively moral, and number two, through causing disruption of the public to create debate, to create the fight stage, to create the new resolution. Okay, so before I come on to like, you know, concluding comments about all this, I just want to mention another aspect of this sort of psychology of the group, you know, the the, the moral community, the chain of being, how, how this works. And in, an essential element of this is seeing is believing, right? It's not about receiving information, like all these climate scientists give information. It's seeing the disruption. It's the optics of emotional disruption that creates the fluidity that creates the change. So this is like a catastrophic error of sort of reductive materialism, which is why I'm harping on about it, which is to think, oh, you just give the information, they process it, and then they act. No. People are emotional beings. They have value systems. They have meaning systems. They want recognition. They want love. They want glory. They want something to believe in, right? And they have to be disrupted, and they have to see that disruption right? They have to have their meaning systems disrupted in a visual way. You have to throw that soup onto the, you know, icon of modern culture, the, 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 the sunflowers. You don't go to the police station because no one's bothered about the bloody police station, right? So Michael Mann, for instance, who, you know, with all due respect, epitomizes this, you know, 18th century view of how change happens. You know, he does a tweet and says, Oh, you should have gone to BP, you know, throw some paint over BP, for God's sake. BP has no meaning for the general public. It's just a bad company. What you're trying to do here is disrupt the public, okay? As an end in itself, as as a, as a end in itself, so that it creates the next step, because you're getting those, those, those eyeballs, as you might say. This is, you know... This has been going on for hundreds of years. Look at the suffragettes, you know. Emily Pankhurst was put into prison. The following day, a woman went and ripped up a painting of a massive nude. Massively controversial, massively effective. Everyone's talking about women's rights. That's how cr change is, is, is happens, right? So before I sort of conclude with practicalities, um, I want to try and sum up a new vision of democracy. There's this old view that there's the government and there's the media and here's the people. And the government and the media basically control atomized groups, separate individuals. 
And then there's this new view. Yes, there's the government and the media, but the people are deciding for themselves. That's what democracy means, right? We decide. We, the people, decide. But we don't decide because the media have told us what to do or the government. We decide ourselves, but critically, we decide ourselves through conflict and through drama. So this is like not a utopian view of democracy where people are sitting down and deliberating, useful as that is. It's a realist view of a functioning democracy which understands that human beings and groups leave the path of God, as it were. They become degenerate. They fall into immorality. They end up destroying, right, the planet, the next generation. And this society is reformed through this process of disruption. The small groups of people, like the suffragettes, like the civil rights campaigners, like the people on the motorways, like the people today in London sitting in the road. And what they're saying is, we need to decide to be good, right? We need to decide to engage in love, connectivity, sociability, because if we don't, we're going to not survive, right? So we know that the media, the billionaire-owned media, they claim to speak on behalf of the people, right? They claim to speak. And what they say is, you're disrupting the public, right? And they dominate this, this debate here. They frame this debate. You're disrupting the public. Why are you disrupting the public, right? But this is counteracted by the optics of disruption, the optics of people being arrested, the optics of people sacrificing, the optics of a mother being carried away going, I'm doing this for my son. In other words, the emotionality of collective morality trumps the media, right? Which doesn't mean that these people aren't mad. These people are as mad as hell, right? People hate to be disrupted. But the disruptors are inviting them into a community of dialogue and debate and yes, conflict, at least initially. And in time, through that open dialogue of disruption and, and communication, this group creates their own, their own agenda, right? Separate from the government and the corporate class and the media. But it can only be enacted through this short time, short term sort of hate and conflict phase you know, where people are spitting at you and kicking you and all the rest of it, right? And that, that is not an unfortunate byproduct. That's the actual mechanism through which this reformation process, reformation process works. And so like, more broadly, what these people want, what these people want is they're actually subliminally support the idea of being disrupted. In the same way as people moralise, right, and get enraged about interpersonal moral issues. That's why people watch soap operas. People are, we're hardwired to moralise about moral dilemmas. Should that disruption happen or shouldn't it? People enjoy that. People want to be engaged in that debate. They don't want to sit there thinking those are those activists doing to that to, to the police station, right? Subliminally, they want to be involved in the conversation. They want to have that connectivity, even though it creates that conflict, because that makes them feel whole. And being part of a national community and a, a local community and a family community, whatever it is, people are happy to go through that conflict. Just as in your relationships, you know you're going to have conflict and that's good and that keeps you in that relationship. So as you can see, and thank you for getting to this end part of the video, as you can see, what if we're going to be smart about doing disruption, smart about saving the next 10,000 generations, we need to re-interrogate, right? You know, we need to look anew 
at these concepts we've been given by the ruling class, by the elites, whatever you want to call it, right? We need to think again about what the individual is, what community is. We need to think again about, about what disruption is. Why disruption, not always, but often, is functional and justified. Okay, so what we've, what we've been saying in this video is, is disruption is essential for survival and for justice. A society and global society in the next three or four years is gonna destroy itself unless there's massive disruption. And that's justified because it's unbelievably unjust to kill and destroy the lives and livelihoods of billions of people. I mean, there's no question about that. The causality is, is clear. And the, the people in Western societies will welcome being challenged, will welcome it in time, because it's a pathway to some sort of redemptive salvation, right? It's a pathway to a renewed mental health. It's a pathway to a new vision of democratic participation. And what we've been saying is, there's no question about the proportionality of it, right? Disruption isn't good or bad in itself. It's only good if it's proportionate. And blocking motorways and throwing paint and all the rest of it is obviously proportionate when you're facing this monstrosity, right? And then there's a the question of effectiveness. There is no question that disruption is effective. The only question is doing enough of it. It needs to remain non-violent, it needs to be proportionate, blocking motorways, all these things are within the, in the broad spectrum of proportionality, without a question of a doubt. And, and this is the rub really, is they're only going to be effective if there's the numbers. You're only going to be effective in that strike if you get the numbers out. And that's the practical issue I want to finish this video, right? This is not, <laughs> let me emphasize, this is nothing to do with some nice academic, you know, information sharing, Sunday afternoon, watch one of Roger's videos, right? This is, is about you. And as I said, and I think my last big video is, is if someone's got to the end of this video, you are one of the 1% of the 1% who are going to save the world, without a question of a doubt, right? And as I said, you know, in this video I've mentioned, people who watched uh, How to Stop the Climate Crisis in Six Months, they are now initiating the biggest climate campaigns in the Western world, directly on the back of those videos that I've done. So the biggest campaign in Italy has involved disrupting motorways. The biggest climate campaign in France has involved disrupting motorways. The biggest climate campaign in Sweden, Germany, you know, arguably Canada, they've all used this methodology, this logic of creating change through disruption, through the disruption of, of, the, of the public. So at the bottom of this video, look at the information. There's links to various networks, links to various videos you can look at. There's the A22 network, which is this network around the Western world of people who are getting the headlines, getting tens of millions of hits and growing this mass mobilization so that we can do what happened in Serbia, where thousands of people go on the motorways or go in the center of cities and they're inspired by these small groups of people who have shown the way and we've got two years I mean we've got two years okay you know sometimes you go to the doctor and the doctor says you've got six months unless you you know engage in you know chemotherapy that's the real the reality of the situation so share this video as widely as possible if you think it's a bit rubbish, that's totally fine. Remake it, slice it up, you know, put tweets out about it, do whatever you like. It's just like over to you guys now. And I just wish you all the best of luck in everything you do. Thanks.